Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Five Days of Stem Cell virtual event. Uh, my name is Edwin Gullis, and I am the Field Application Scientist for 3D and Advanced Cell Models for Thermo Fisher. Uh, through this event, we are excited to connect you to the latest stem cell technologies, research breakthroughs, and esteemed scientists from around the world, all from the comfort of anywhere. Uh, with that, I will introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Jarman Lees. Uh, Dr. Lees completed his PhD at the University of Melbourne in 2017, where he ex examined the role of metabolism in regulating pluripotent stem cell, uh, pluripotent stem cell pluripotency and neural differentiation. He then worked on the de development of a novel pluripotent stem cell growth formulation while working for Vitra Life in 2018. Uh, Jarman joined the Cardiac Regeneration Group at St. Vincent's as a research fellow examining cardiomyopathy in Frederick's ataxia and strategies for innovating human cardiac tissue using pluripotent stem cells. The Cardiac Regeneration Lab is involved in modeling a range of heart diseases using a novel vascularized and innervated cardiac organoid model. If you have questions during the presentation, please add them to the question log and we will address them after Dr. Lee's presentation. With that, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much, Edwin, and uh, thank you very much to Gibco and to Thermo Fisher for inviting me to speak here uh, this afternoon, or at least it's, it's this afternoon here in Melbourne. Uh, so yeah, my name's Jarman Lees, um, and I'm from the Cardiac Regeneration Lab at St. Vincent's Institute of Medical Research um, in Melbourne, Australia. And today I'd like to talk to you about our lab's really exciting, um, completely human, iPSC-derived vascularized and innovated cardiac organoids. And we're going to be looking at how we're validating these organoids for use in disease modeling, including things like cardiotoxicity testing, simulated ischemia reperfusion injury, um, and in particular, we're going to focus on um, our lab's most recent model of type 2 diabetic cardiomyopathy. Um, so first, a quick overview of my research at St. Vincent's Institute. Um, I have two main focuses, uh, the first of which is Friedrich's ataxia, uh, which is an inherited neuromuscular disorder, um, which comes with an associated cardiomyopathy. And in this disease in particular, we're looking at the role of non-myocytes in the heart as novel targets for treating this disease, which um, currently has no treatments or cure. And my second focus, which will be the, the focus of today's talk, is using human iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes and non-myocytes to construct cardiac tissue for disease modeling. So that involves taking human-induced pluripotent stem cells, differentiating them into a range of cardiac cell types, and then constructing, constructing what we call in our lab our cardiac organoids. And why would we want to do this? Well, heart disease is still the number one cause of death worldwide. Now, here in Australia, um, it's roughly one in five people who suffer from some, for some form of cardiovascular disease at any given time. Um, that ends up being 123 men, women, and even some children dying each and every day from a whole different range of heart diseases. Um, worldwide, that's more like 50,000 people every day, or 18 million people every year. And this number is only going up, not down. And is it any wonder when there are so many and varied contributing factors to heart disease, um, some of which are completely unavoidable, um, such as trying to stay stress-free in 2020. I'll try anyone to, to do that. Um, but in addition, things like aging um, or even, you know, a cup of coffee or, or recreational alcohol, all of these things contribute to heart disease. And on top of that, what's really, really unfortunate is that some medications, and these might be chemotherapy drugs, or they might even be drugs used to treat a variety of heart diseases, can in themselves be cardiotoxic and arrhythmogenic. And on a highly topical note, and this next image comes with a trigger warning, um, it may be distressing to some viewers. Um, so yeah, apologies for that. I know here in Australia, we see this image on the news every night. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite distressing. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, there's some really, really good evidence now to suggest that SARS-CoV-2 infects human heart tissue. And if the original outbreak of SARS-CoV-1 uh, back in 2002, which we just commonly know as SARS, uh, is anything to go by, then roughly 40% of people who recovered from SARS 
went on to have cardiac complications within the, the following 12 years. <clears throat> so it's entirely possible that this outbreak, um, or this virus will be with us for the rest of our lives, vaccination or no vaccination. Anyway, that's enough doom and gloom. Um, how are we trying to fix these problems? Well, what we need are cutting edge human heart disease models, state of the art disease modeling and accurate drug screening. Unfortunately, current human heart disease models typically look more like this, a two dimensional monolayer of cells. And they typically include only a single cell type, which is usually the cardiomyocytes. When we know in fact that the human heart is a highly vascularized and highly innovated organ, um, and we know that both of these systems play really important roles in uterine exchange, um, paracrine signaling, and in many cases, these cells and these systems, the vascular system and the cardiac nervous system, are intimately involved in the pathogenesis of a variety of diseases. So the vascular system, for example, um, is estimated to secrete somewhere in the order of 30 to 60 cardiokines, um, if you will, things like VEGF or, or nitric oxide, which are vital for healthy cardiovascular function. Um, and in particular today, we're going to be talking about the endothelial cells, which are that single layer of cells um, that make up the vessel wall. Um, so if they're all on their own, then they form capillary beds. Um, but in larger vessels, um, they're surrounded by layers of, of smooth muscles, um, smooth muscle cells and extracellular matrices. So again, capillary beds on their own or in larger vessels, they make up that very innermost layer um, facing the lumen of the vessel. And of course, having a vascular system is quite important if you want to be able to study diseases such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, microvascular disease, um, or endothelial to mesenchymal transition. The autonomic nervous system, on the other hand, is the heart's semi-autonomous nervous system made up of many thousands upon thousands of sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons. Uh, that regulate the heart rate through the release of neurotransmitters, either uh, noradrenaline or uh, acetylcholine. And in this talk today, we're going to be looking at the sympathetic neurons, which release noradrenaline to increase heart rate. And we know that disorders of the autonomic nervous system, and generally these are the sympathetic nervous system, or the sympathetic nervous system in particular, can contribute to some common heart diseases, including several of the autosomal dominant hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, and a range of arrhythmias. So in order to study any of the diseases of the vascular system or the autonomic nervous system in the heart, we've historically turned to animal models. And these are fantastic because the cardiovascular system and the autonomic nervous system are present and whole as they should be. Um, however, there are some fairly fundamental aspects of the heart, such as heart rate, which are quite different. So you can see that the human heart rate um, comes in at around 72 beats per minute, whereas the rodent heart rate is around 10 times that. And we know that for a range of heart diseases, um, animal models do not sufficiently recapitulate the human disease pathogenesis. And we often find that drug efficacy and toxicity are species specific as well. So that said, how do we make a model of the human heart that incorporates not only the cardiomyocytes and perhaps the fibroblasts, but also the vascular cells and the autonomic neurons as well. And of course, I'm referring to iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, so these are the embryonic, these are embryonic-like stem cells, um, but they're derived not from embryonic tissue, but of course from adult tissue. And they're fantastic to work with in the lab because you can never run out um, and we can make as many differentiated cells as we need. Uh, they're also fantastic for modeling genetic diseases um, because they retain the genetic makeup of the individual from which they're derived. Um, so in our lab, we work with Friedrich's ataxia, which is a genetic disease, and in particular, that's a, a, a monoclonal, uh, sorry, a monogenic disease, so it's a single mutation. But iPSCs are also particularly useful for complex polygenic diseases, um, such as diabetes, where there are too many mutations uh, to really induce um, uh, through gene editing. For us though, they are the blank canvas from which we can start to make our vascularized and innovated cardiac organoids. So 
our ideal human heart disease model would look less like this, a two-dimensional layer of cardiomyocytes, and more like this, a three-dimensional multicellular organoid model. Which brings me to the aim of the project that I'm discussing with you here today, which was to engineer a human IPSC-derived cardiac organoid with an integrated microvascular system and a sympathetic nervous system for modeling human heart disease. So we begin our organoid construction uh, process by differentiating cardiomyocytes from IPSCs using a robust 19-day protocol. And this gives rise to functional cardiomyocytes. Um, uh, these cardiomyocytes are then purified using metabolic selection uh, with lactate, and they dis uh, display typical cardiomyocyte markers such as alpha-actin and, and troponin T. They exhibit a really nice rhythmic beating, uh, which we can measure using our in-house multi-electrode array system, um, which measures the extracellular field potential or the electrical activity of the cardiomyocytes. And we've adapted this both for our two-dimensional monolayer adherent cells, um, as well as for our 3D organoid model as well, which is a suspension um, organoid model. So this, the organoids are free floating. So what we have here are some of our iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes feeding spontaneously in the dish. Feeding very, very slowly. I think that the, perhaps just the video is a little bit laggy, that's all. Um, eventually, or I'm, I'm, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so there are some green, the green flashes that you could, uh, oh, that uh, flashed up briefly there uh, are a calcium indicator, which binds to the intracellular calcium um, during the contractions. Um, we've also published some work showing that these iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes are responsive to chronotropic drugs um, that target the beta adrenoreceptors and acetylcholine receptors, increasing or decreasing the beating rate respectively. So highly functional cells that we can make in a dish reproducibly. To form the microvascular system, we use iPSC-derived endothelial cells. So differentiating endothelial cells takes roughly seven days um, in our lab, at which point we purify them by fax for the marker CD31, and they express typical endothelial cell markers such as CD31, the cadherin, and the von Willebrand factor. Now, excitingly, these iPSC-derived endothelial cells are incredibly functional. Um, in vitro and, and also in vivo. So when we seed them into something like a fibrin gel, they form these really nice capillary bed-like structures. Um, and then when we go on to surgically implant them into say a mouse, those human vessels inosculate or merge with the mouse vessels such that when we inject a green dye into the tail vein of that mouse, um, we can then find that same green dye inside the human vessels which are actually located in the stomach. So we've managed to make a functional connection there between um, the human iPSC-derived endothelial cells and the mouse vasculature as well. To add to that vascular network, we also make smooth muscle cells from human iPSCs. So this is a relatively straightforward process. Uh, it takes about a week in our lab and it gives an almost completely pure population of vascular smooth muscle cells. Um, and as an added bonus, of course, as you can see, they're highly photogenic, which is always nice. To innovate those organoids, we use iPSC-derived sympathetic neurons. Um, these neurons are differentiated over a four-week period and express the char characteristic sympathetic markers uh, such as FOX2B, tyrosine hydroxylase, and peripherin. And after about six weeks, we can start to find catecholamines, such as dopamine and noradrenaline being secreted into the medium. And we're also able to measure calcium transients within these neurons as well. We can then plate them out onto our multi-electrode array. Um, and like our cardiomyocytes, we can start to pick up the spontaneous electrical signals um, being generated by these sympathetic neurons, um, which tend to increase with, uh, in frequency and amplitude over time suggesting that we've achieved a level of maturation and that we have functional um, human iPSC-derived sympathetic neurons in vitro.
and then we come to actually constructing the organoids themselves. So as I've mentioned, these organoids are completely human iPSC derived, and we differentiate each of the component cell types individually over about a four week period. Um, and I often get questions about why we, we feel the need to construct these um, the individual cell types first before constructing the organoids later. Um, and that comes back to the fact that we're combining cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, sympathetic neurons, smooth muscle cells, and cardiac fibroblasts together um, to form one very complex um, multicellular um, cardiac organoid. And at the moment, there's, there's really no way of constructing or differentiating all of these different cell types in the same differentiation. Um, so for a lot of other organoid models, you take a single pluripotent stem cell culture um, and then you differentiate it in one go uh, to give rise to a kidney organoid or to a neural organoid. Um, at the moment, if you differentiate cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cells, you might be able to get some fibroblasts, but they're unlikely to be epicardially derived fibroblasts like ours. Um, you're likely to get a very small percentage of endothelial cells, um, but again, there's really no way of controlling that, and you're very unlikely to get um, your sympathetic neurons in there. Um, so that's why we, we take this approach, because we have complete control over the purity, um, the maturation, and the percentages of the cells that are going into our, into our cardiac organoids. So we uh, then combine all these cells together, and within as little as one week, we have these beating cardiac organoids. Um, and as I said, we've been constructing increasingly complex organoids using a combination of, of all of the cell types that you can see there. However, the data that I'll be presenting today um, will primarily be on cardiac organoids constructed using the cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and sympathetic neurons. So we ran a couple of our organoids through an RNA-seq, uh, single-cell RNA-seq, sorry, pipeline, and confirmed that, firstly, the transcriptional profile of individual organoids is very, very similar. Um, and secondly, that we're able to identify all of the input cell types um, that we incorporated into the organoids by their transcriptional signatures. Um, so that's very comforting. We can measure the beating rate of our organoids um, quite simply actually using uh, Brightfield video microscopy. And we can match this up to the electrical data that we get from our 3D multi-electrode arrays. And we find that organoid beating rate is highly consistent, coming in at around 170 beats per minute over three to four weeks of culture. So this is quite a bit faster than your adult resting heart rate of 70 beats per minute. And actually it's, it's very similar to the uh, fetal heart rate about nine weeks in utero. And we think that this makes a lot of sense given that iPSC derived tissues are typically quite fetal in nature. And in fact, the whole stem cell field um, is grappling with this issue of, of maturing stem cell derived tissues in vitro. It's not entirely clear how successful uh, we are at this at the moment or how, how successful we will be anytime soon. Hello, um, <laughs> I've lost access to my slides.
And am I back? Okay, it seems like I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, yeah, we're able to uh, to gather quite a lot of, of contraction-related information from our organoids. And as I mentioned, we've, we've, um, we can get the beating rate, but we can also get things like uh, the contraction duration, um, uh, which, is the, which is made up of things like the time to peak in a contraction, as well as the relaxation time, the time that it takes for an organoid to actually relax after its beat after it's contracted. Um, and finally, we're able to measure the force or the amplitude of that contraction as well. And this allows us to collect quite a lot of data non-invasively um, without needing to damage or harvest the organoids um, simply by taking these, these bright field uh, videos of them, which allows us to perform long-term studies quite easily. The other thing that we can do quite easily um, is control the size of these organoids. So essentially making much smaller organoids allows us to make more, although we always keep the cell ratios um, consistent. So here's one of the larger organoids uh, that we can make, reaching well over 1.5 millimeters in diameter. So obviously at this uh, size, vascularization of the organoid becomes quite important because nutrient diffusion into tissue is limited to only about 200 microns. So 200 microns of tissue looks a little bit like this. So this is the amount of tissue around the edge um, that would receive oxygen by simple diffusion, while the entire black region in the center there will become hypoxic and die if that tissue isn't properly vac vascularized. So to avoid issues of core necrosis, it's really important to check that the organoids are well and truly vascularized. And our organoids are indeed vascularized, as, as I'll show you the next few slides. So in red here, you can see CD31 positive endothelial cells dispersed throughout the, the entire organoid, um, supporting that cardiac troponin T positive cardiomyocyte population in green there. And this is a single slice taken through an organoid. In the image on the left, you can see CD31 positive endothelial cells forming what looks very much to me like a capillary bed, suggesting that we have achieved an endothelial structure that might even support nutrient flow. And on the right, we have this really nice clearing enhanced 3D model of the vascular endothelial cell network showing the extent of that vasculature. I can zoom in there. So we can see that endothelial network throughout the tissue, which we believe facilitates nutrient diffusion right to the very center of those organoids. And to check that we're actually getting nutrient flow to the very center of the organoids, we spiked our organoid medium uh, with some green fluorescent nanoparticles and let them diffuse over two hours in culture. So the organoids are continuously shaken um, during culture um, to facilitate that nutrient diffusion. And we do this um, routinely. So over our normal sort of three to five week organoid culture periods, they're, they're shaken continuously in the incubator. And in this case, after two hours, we fixed section the organoids and we can find those green fluorescent nanoparticles throughout the organoid tissue, including right to the very center of the organoids, which suggests that we've traversed a distance of about 750 microns, which is well in excess of the 200 microns you'd expect uh, without vascularization. In addition to this, we've looked at um, cell death markers such as cleave caspase 3, and we find no evidence of core necrosis in organoids of any size that we're able to make. Another cell type present in our organoids um, is the sympathetic neurons. So here you can see some, some really lovely sympathetic neurons stained with tyrosine hydroxylase innovating that cardiac tissue. Here they are again, uh, this time stained with a more general autonomic marker, peripherin, confirming that we've managed to innovate our cardiac organoids. And our short reconstruction, um, which I made here, which is why it doesn't look as good as the previous one, um, showing the innovation and network nature of those neurons. And we also have some preliminary data suggesting that the inclusion of the sympathetic neurons does affect our organoid function. So having sympathetic neurons present in the organoids appears to 
uh, increase the force of the contractions and to a lesser extent increase the rate of the contractions as well. And this fits in quite nicely with our understanding of what um, of the role of the sympathetic nervous system, which regulates that fight or flight response and generally increases heart rate. So our organoids also contain cardiac fibroblasts, uh, which, can see, uh, which you can see here stained um, red with bimentin. And you can also see the morphological maturation of the cardiomyocytes as well, um, stained with cardiac troponin T in green. So on the left, we have an organoid on day one after construction, and you can see the, the haphazard sort of arrangement of those cardiomyocytes. Whereas on the right, we have an organoid that's been beating in culture for four weeks, and the cardiomyocytes appear to have aligned themselves um, along those contraction lines, those stress lines. Our organoids are also very active in their um, secretion of extracellular matrices. And we can find quite a range of different collagen types being secreted in these organoids. Here in red, we have collagen one um, showing an increase. And, and once again, we're showing an increase in the collagen deposition over the four weeks going from left to right there. But particularly excited to have cardiac fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells in our cardiac organoids because this allows us to model a range of heart diseases where fibrosis and um, extracellular matrix secretions play a role in the disease. So for example, and we'll come back to this later, uh, but following ischemia reperfusion injury, which models what happens during and after a heart attack, we can start to see this really nice example of cardiac interstitial fibrosis, um, where the collagen has been laid down around the cardiomyocytes. So this really opens up the door to start looking at human-specific antifibrotic agents in a way which we haven't been able to before. So if we want to look at fibrosis and antifibrotic agents in heart disease, and we're not limited to ischemia or perfusion injury here, um, then we really need cardiac fibroblasts to be present in these models. There's also every reason to think that the vasculature and the autonomic nervous system are going to play important roles in cardiac fibrosis through things like endothelial to mesenchymal transition and arrhythmias, which might damage the, the myocardium as well. Of course. Engineering the organoids is only the first step. Um, their purpose, of course, is to be used um, as models of human heart disease and for drug screening. So now I'd like to talk you through three heart disease models that we've been working on using these cardiac organoids. Um, first up is going to be a model of type 2 diabetic cardiomyopathy. Um, second, a brief cardiotoxicity model based around the commonly used chemotherapy drug doxorubicin. And third, a model of ischemia reperfusion injury. And importantly, we have excellent evidence from clinical studies and a whole body of basic research indicating that the non-myocytes, such as the vasculature or the cardiac autonomic nervous system, play really important roles in the pathogenesis of all of these diseases, either directly or indirectly through the interaction with the cardiomyocytes. So that brings me to our lab's most recent endeavor, which is to model type 2 diabetic heart disease. Now, diabetes is the fastest growing chronic disease in Australia and in most of the developed world. Um, diabetics are significantly more likely to develop heart disease than your average healthy individual. And it's a major... There are currently no specific treatments for diabetic heart disease, and this may partly be due to the lack of sufficiently complex human preclinical models for this disease. We know that diabetes affects not just the cardiac muscle tissue, but also the cardiac vascular system, resulting in microvascular disease, coronary artery disease, and as well as influencing the cardiac nerve system, giving rise to things like autonomic neuropathy and arrhythmias. So a human preclinical model of diabetic heart disease that includes elements of both the autonomic nervous system and the vascular system may have a much better chance of accurately modeling the diseases and streamlining the bench to bedside process. Now, diabetic cardiomyopathy, um, which is heart disease induced by diabetes, generally includes increased reactive oxygen species, fibrosis, and inflammation in the heart. There's also impaired relaxation and contraction of the left ventricle. So 
the healthy contraction profile, such as that shown in black, um, becomes elongated to look like the figure in red, where both the time to peak and the relaxation times are longer. And this phenotype um, is one of the hallmarks of diabetic cardiomyopathy, the elongation of the contraction times. So type 2 diabetes is the most common of the three diabetes, the other two being type 1 and gestational diabetes. Um, and it's characterized by insulin resistance leading to hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, so high levels of circulating glucose and fatty acids. And far too often, this leads to heart failure and death. So we simulated a type 2 diabetic environment um, in vitro with 25 millimolar glucose, um, which was balanced with mannitol in the control conditions and high levels of the fatty acids such as palmitate, oleic acid, and linoleic acid. Um, and I based these concentrations on the reported values for circulating plasma levels of fatty acids um, found in type 2 diabetic patients. Those three, uh, three fatty acids make up the highest fatty acid um, uh, burden in, in type 2 diabetics as well. So here are some of our cardiac organoids cultured in either control or type 2 diabetic conditions. Um, and we've cultured these organoids and many, many more, of course, in these conditions for up to about two weeks now. And we're looking to push them even further, given, given some of the interesting data we've collected. Now, you won't be able to see anything by eye there um, to distinguish between those two. But um, as I've mentioned before, from these videos, we can get quite a lot of information about the contraction profiles of these organoids. Um, so we can measure the time that it takes for the organoids to contract, which is the time to peak, as well as the time that they take to relax, the relaxation time. And from this, we can see that our type 2 diabetic conditions lengthen both of these parameters over time. And this results in an overall lengthening of the contraction profile, which is consistent with what we see clinically. Um, so we're really excited about that. We haven't yet looked to see what the cause of this might be, um, but we speculate that it might involve things like increased cardiac fibrosis, calcium handling issues in the cardiomyocytes, or other ion channelopathies. We also have data to show that the time between contractions is longer, um, so that the beats per minute or the, uh, the heart rate um, is lower in our type 2 diabetic model. Now, this is particularly interesting as it doesn't quite match up with any of the clinical data. Um, so a lower heart rate is not something that we expect to find in type 2 diabetes, although heart rate variability is something that we might expect. Um, so this is something that we'll need to look into further. It's worth noting that in vivo, the human heart, while, um, while partially autonomous, is always being regulated by the brain. So we know that our type 2 diabetic model impairs cardiac contractility possibly through increased tissue stiffness. It's plausible that in vivo in this situation, there'd be increased sympathetic signaling from the brain um, to maintain a regular heart rate. And while our organoids have a sympathetic, neuron, uh, have a sympathetic um, neural signaling, they don't have a central nervous system um, to control that. So there's a lot to look into here, and we think that this preclinical human model of type two diabetic cardiomyopathy is going to make an excellent complement uh, to the preclinical animal models that we already have. Our lab has also briefly looked at the application of these organoids uh, in cardiotoxicity testing. Um, so this is a really important area for the stem cell and cardiovascular field. Um, well over 90% of promising drug candidates fail human clinical trials. Um, the issue being, of course, that most of them never actually should have made it to human clinical trials in the first place. Unfortunately, current preclinical models for efficacy and toxicity are generally animal models. Um, whereas we, we've already spoken about this, many drugs, for many drugs, efficacy and toxicity are often species specific. So a drug that works and is safe in a mouse may not work and in fact be toxic in the human and vice versa. So how do we get around this? Well, we overcome this obstacle and the massive attrition rate with human preclinical models, models that detect cardiotoxicity well before the clinical trial phase. And this is where we believe our organoid model can come in. So here we've done some very basic characterization looking at a very commonly used chemotherapy drug, doxorubicin. 
So while doxorubicin is a, is a really effective chemotherapy agent, it has some very well-known um, cardiotoxic side effects, making it a really good model drug for testing our model's uh, capacity um, to sense uh, cardiotoxicity. So after treating our organoids with doxorubicin for two hours, we can observe a robust increase in the release of lactate dehydrogenase, which is a general marker for cell death, indicating that our organoids are able to detect um, these sorts of cardiotoxic agents. And this is only the most preliminary of assessments. The next step here is to determine if, these, if the non-myocyte populations increase the sensitivity of our model, particularly with regards to drugs that are known to affect uh, either the nervous system or the vascular system specifically. And that's where these multicellular cardiac organoids may be able to make the most impact in this area. Uh, the last form of heart disease I'll touch on today, um, but certainly not the least, is heart attack. So heart attacks fall under the umbrella of ischemic heart diseases um, in which the heart doesn't get sufficient oxygen. And it's worth noting that ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide. So a heart attack or a myocardial infarction is caused by a blockage um, in the arteries leading to a loss of oxygen in the cardiac tissue. Um, this generally leads to uh, cardiomyocyte death, adverse cardiac tissue remodeling, um, usually into fibrotic tissue, and all too often once again, heart failure and death. Now, if that blockage in the arteries is cleared, either by surgical means or by drugs, then we get reperfusion or reoxygenation of the cardiac tissue. And while this is great because we're alive, um, reperfusion following a period of ischemia causes quite serious damage to the cardiac tissue. And this is known as ischemia reperfusion injury. So in addition to the damage caused by the hypoxia, reperfusion tends to result in massive, uh, massive surge in reactive oxygen species and cytokine release known as cytokine storm. We also get plenty of involvement from the non-myocytes in the heart, including things like the endothelial cells, uh, so endothelial cell dysfunction, endothelial to mesenchymal transition, or alternatively, once the vasculature starts to reboot and we get neo uh, neoangiogenesis, we start to get mesenchymal to an endothelial transition. From the cardiac nervous system, we get altered neurotransmitter release, which can cause arrhythmias. And then there's also a large immune response, which can cause inflammation. So collectively, this is known uh, as ischemia reperfusion injury. And it's worth noting that while reperfusion does cause damage directly to the cardiomyocytes, many of the disease mechanisms uh, might be indirect, acting on other cell types present in the heart. So what we've done here is simulated a heart attack plus the recovery phase uh, in a dish, looking specifically at whether different non-myocyte populations, uh, endothelial cells or sympathetic neurons affect the outcome. So we constructed cardiac organoids um, of different cellular compositions, either 100% cardiomyocytes or with specific percentages of endothelial cells, sympathetic neurons, or both together. We then simulated ischemia reperfusion uh, by depriving them of oxygen and serum for two hours uh, and then reoxygenating them for a further 24 hours. And then looked at lactate dehydrogenase secretion again as a, as a marker of general cell death. So on this graph, we have our different organoid compositions across the bottom, our control organoids in black, and our organoids subjected to ischemia reperfusion injury uh, in red. And we can immediately see that ischemia reperfusion injury induces a really nice toxicity response as seen by the, uh, by the high LDH release after 24 hours. And we also see that the different cell compositions um, affect the severity of that response. In particular, um, the inclusion of the sympathetic neurons makes the model more sensitive to ischemia reperfusion injury. So we're really excited about this data, um, which suggests that the non-myocytes are gonna be really important for this disease pathogenesis and are, that they're necessary for accurately modeling um, this and other human heart diseases. So to finish up, our cardiac organoids are vascularized and they're innovated. Uh, they're completely human derived and they're completely human IPSC derived at that, which makes them really amenable uh, for modeling genetic diseases. They're also scalable for high throughput screening um, should the need arise. 
And most importantly, we've shown that they can be useful for modeling a variety of contraction-related pathologies, such as type 2 diabetic uh, cardiomyopathy. And we also have some data to show that they're going to be useful for toxicity screening, as well as things like modeling ischemia or reperfusion injury. So I'd like to finish just by saying that we believe that these vascularized and innovated cardiac organoids are a marked improvement over the more traditional two-dimensional models, as both the vascular and the nervous systems are really important for accurately modeling diseases and therefore for developing effective treatments to those diseases. And that just leaves me to thank all of the people who are involved in this work, as well as all of the funding bodies who made uh, all of this work possible. Uh, thank you, and of course, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. That was a great presentation. Uh, we do have uh, some questions in the uh, in the questions log uh, uh, that we'd like you to answer. Um, first of, uh, question we have is, uh, when you're doing your RNA, uh, your uh, single cell sequencing, how have you been able to remove the uh, ECM uh, matrix gel uh, from the organoids to prepare them for the uh, for efficient sequencing? Yeah, so we, we digest the organoids using uh, collagenase um, and then fax sort them. So we're, we're pretty comfortable that we, that we manage to get um, uh, single live cells um, and for the most part, ECM free with that. Okay. We, we, I've been told that the, the, that the RNA that we were getting out at the end was, was of, of excellent quality. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good enough. Thank you. Uh, next question we have is, uh, any thoughts on uh, the, going, when you're going through the process of preparing the differentiated cells, uh, being able to accelerate that process? Uh, you know, it sounds like there's you know, quite a bit of steps and it does take a bit of time for the different cell types. Any thoughts on uh, ways of uh, improving the process to uh, get them to their endpoint faster? Yeah, so the lead up to actually constructing the organoids is is very very time consuming that's a it's a full-on job just uh for me uh to do that um our cardiomyocytes need to be made fresh um so they take about three weeks to make and they need to be made sort of three weeks before before organoid construction whereas something like the endothelial cells we make them we, we purify them we freeze them um, the same goes for the fibroblasts, the same goes for the smooth muscle cells and sympathetic neurons as well. We're able to freeze them as well. So it's, it's really just the cardiomyocytes which need to be made fresh each time. All the other cell types can be sort of um, differentiated, expanded and, and stocked down. Um, in terms of making the, the cardiomyocytes um, faster, at the moment, three weeks is not too bad. Um, our main priority is is getting a pure a pure population of all of the cell types that we use, um, and so we're we're quite um, insistent on having on using really strict sort of metabolic selection for our cardiomyocytes, um, for our sympathetic neurons. Um, we get a really good population of, of tyrosine hydroxylase and, and peripheral positive um, sympathetic neurons, and we're, we're using reporter lines um, for that as well. Um, and then we do fax sorting for the other cell types. Um, so. Yeah, by being able to, to expand them and freeze them down, the timing is not too much of an issue. Um, we're far more concerned about maintaining a really good pure population um, so that we have reproducible and consistent organoids each time we do it. Uh, yeah, that's great. It's, I'm a big fan of being able to add complexity to these models and the fact that you can freeze these cells down and then just rely on one, um, uh, the cardiomyocytes for the fresh isolation. I really... Uh, and I'll afford you some flexibility on that. I was um, kind of wondering how you did it, but that's, mm. uh, that's good to know. Um, next question uh, here. Uh, what are your, th your thoughts on combining this particular system, uh, the cardiac system, uh, with other uh, uh, 3D organoid systems such as the brain, the liver, and kidney to study, see how the, your model can affect other organs? I was curious if you had thought about uh, um, using your mo uh, your model in that way? I absolutely have not thought about sort of combining it with um, with other organoid models um, at this point. Um, okay. uh, I, <clears throat> I'm I'm sort of intrigued. As I as I mentioned, we we don't have any sort of central nervous system control in our in our in our organoids. We have sympathetic neurons in there, um, and whether or not they we know that they're, they're active, we know that they're secreting um, their neurotransmitters, 
um, but there's there's really no feedback system there if if uh, if the cardiac function is decreasing for them to actually increase production or anything like that. The only way that we can affect their activity is is either through optogenetic approaches or through drugs. Um, but we don't have like a, an innate sort of uh, central nervous system. The only other thing that um, has sort of sprung to mind is sort of including sort of like a lymphatic system as well. So I know some people um, around our sort of research institute are, are quite involved in making lymphatic systems. Um, so including that into our organoid model might be interesting, but I haven't thought about um, branching out to its interaction with other organoid models particularly. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with the uh, cardiotoxicity testing. Uh, what type of throughput can be achieved for the cardiac organoids uh, for the cardiotoxicity testing or drug screening uh, that you had mentioned uh, in the presentation? Sorry, what type of what? Sorry, uh, throughput. Like, uh, is it? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what yep. type of Sorry. throughput yep. for the yep. uh, for that model? Yeah. Yep. So um, I can't go into too many specifics about how we engineer um, these organoids. That's that's a little bit tied up in in IP. Um, but suffice it to say that. We can control the size of these organoids quite easily. Um, as I said, we can we can make them quite large, uh, but we can also make them quite small. And at that point, you can start to make um, you can start to make several hundred um, at a time. Um, I wouldn't want to have to be the person who who did that because there is a little bit of manual labor in there. Um, but yeah, I, I can I can envision making several hundred um, at a time if if the need arose for that sort of a, a process. Yeah. I'm assuming these are all done by hand. So, uh, would uh, automation be something that would you like to be able to incorporate uh, for that process, if possible? Um, yeah, I, I imagine that it would be all sorts of, of engineering um, whiz kids who could who could quite easily um, design something to do what what takes me a fair bit of time to sort of go around, you know, each um, each plate and um, and and do. Um, so, yeah, I, I can I can. I think it wouldn't be too difficult to automate a process that is taking me a little bit of time and get that done more reliably and, and, and faster. So it, it could quite easily be, be, be scaled up, I think. Yeah. That's good to know. Uh, question, another question that came up is, how long are you able to keep these organoids alive? Yeah, so um, I think the work, the stuff that we're showing you today, um, the diabetic stuff, um, two weeks after all, some of the other organoids we've been maintaining up to before, and I think the longest week of the month. Um, so over two weeks, um, no decline in interaction parameters. Over four weeks, they're fine as well. By the end of about five weeks, we start to see, um, you know, the amplitude of the, of the contractions decreasing a little bit. Um, so we haven't taken them out anything past past five weeks, um, but they're healthy. There's no core necrosis at, at that point in time. Um, I suspect that eventually. That would occur um, that the tissues would start to to differentiate beyond our beyond our control, but certainly by about five weeks they're they're still fine. Okay. Uh, I think especially with the with the vascularization, you're you're definitely extending the uh, uh, lifespan of that of of this particular model. So I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, we hope so. Keep yep. them. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what uh, you mentioned that there's you know there's quite a, um, a variety of cell types are involved in your a cardiac model, uh, and I think you touched on possibly adding in lymphatic cells, but were there any other cell types you were considering just for the cardiac organoid model? Uh, there are a few, and I'm going um, I'm to keep them under wraps. Um, if people would like to to uh, contact me and, and speak to me individually um, with some ideas and, 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 you know, work towards some sort of collaborative approach, that would be fantastic. But, um, yeah, no, we have, we have lots of ideas. Um, how to go forward with this model, and, and all, and and there are a few other cell types that we're we're interested in looking at as well and incorporating in. Um, but yeah, you'll have to you'll just have to invite me back to speak to hear more about that. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, it's, it's maybe uh, one of those uh, questions where you're, you'll be answering similarly. But what are your your next steps that you will? Con uh, what are the next steps you are considering taking for the ischemia reperfusion injury model? If you're able to speak about that. Uh, skin reflection injury. Uh, so yeah, we'd we'd particularly like to look at the role or the impact of that on 
on on fibrosis. So I, I think I, I briefly showed some some sort of some nice cardiac interstitial fibrosis there. We'd like to, to characterize that a little bit further and start to look at whether or not we can start to use this um, uh, as a sort of antifibrotic drug screening model. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest out there um, in, in the cardiac field for for fibrosis models, and I think our one our model um, is potentially going to fill a really nice nice need there, um, having the cardiomyocytes and as well as those cardiac fibroblasts. Um, yeah, so I think that's our next step. Uh, that's uh, it's all, it's all sounds uh, yeah, really good. Uh, the Megan, the presentation was uh, very informative. Uh, I think it's all the questions that we have uh, from the uh, from the chat room. Um, yeah, so again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lees for uh, taking the time to present to us. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat, and we'll get back. Uh, we can get back to you uh, after the um, after the presentation. Uh, until then, uh, have a great rest of your day or evening, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Edwin.